This lecture is about phase changes. Before we start talking about phase changes, I need to talk again about the kinetic theory of matter, because again, this is the theory that's guiding all our understanding of what's happening in most of this unit, and this is going to matter a lot for the idea of phase changes as well. Again, the theory says that matter is made up of a large number of tiny particles, and the microscopic small behavior of the particles determines the macroscopic large behavior of the material. What we're looking at in this lecture is how the same material, like H2O, can exist in different states like a solid or a liquid or a gas, and what that really means for it to exist in those different states. You can see here that when a material is in its solid state, what's happening to its particles is that they're all kind of stuck together. They still vibrate and have some random kinetic energy, but they don't really change their arrangement. They're kind of being held in place by each other. And when the same material is a liquid, you can see that the molecules are not really holding each other together quite as well as they were before. They're still staying together, they're still in some ways kind of stuck together, but they're much more free to move around. So the same physical material can have very different properties based on how its particles are being held together. And we call these different properties phases of that same material, or a phase of matter, a state in which the matter can exist. We're only going to worry about three phases in this unit, solids, liquids, and gases. You've almost definitely heard of these before, but there may be some properties of solids, liquids, and gases that you don't know about. I'm going to have you take a minute to fill out this table in your notes, and just take down any important information you can see. Notice that in the micro view for the three phases, the particles are being held together in different ways. In the solid, they're being held together very strongly. In the liquid, they're still staying relatively close to each other, so they're still holding each other together in some way. And in the gas, they're just free-floating and not holding each other together at all. You may also notice that the kinetic energy increases as we go from solid to liquid to gas. They're moving more and more as we go down that list. The bonds between the molecules are becoming weaker. They're holding each other together less and less strongly, until in the gas, there's no bonds between the particles at all. The space between the particles gets larger as they go, and there are certain noticeable properties of solids, liquids, and gases that can help us identify which one is which. So just as an example, these are the phases of water, its solid phase is ice, its liquid phase is water, and its gas phase is steam. You'll notice that as we go from solid to liquid to gas, the average kinetic energy of the individual particles is increasing. Each individual particle is moving faster in liquid than it is in solid, and faster in gas than it is in liquid. This means that the temperature increases as we go from solid to liquid to gas, because temperature is literally just a measurement of the average kinetic energy. And this fits our intuition. We normally associate liquid water as being warmer than ice, and steam as being warmer than liquid water. We're now on the main focus of the lecture. A phase change is a way that matter changes its phase from one to another. Each specific phase change has a name that you will have to memorize for this unit. So I'm just going to run through each one and give you an example of each. Going from solid to liquid is called fusion. The more common name for that is just melting. Going from liquid back to solid is freezing. Going from liquid to gas we call vaporization. A more common name for that is just evaporation. Going from gas back to liquid is condensation. So if you've ever had a cold drink like a soda on a hot day, when the gaseous particles of water in the air impact your cold drink, the drink is cold enough to convert that gas back into a liquid, and so the outside of your drink becomes wet. It's also possible to go straight from a solid to a gas. We call that sublimation. And it's possible to go from a gas to a solid. We call that deposition. So again, you will need to memorize these six names for the different phase changes. The particles in a material have an average kinetic energy and an average potential energy. The potential energy is the energy of the bonds holding the particles together. During a phase change, only the average potential energy changes. The average kinetic energy does not change during a phase change, so the temperature does not change during a phase change. I'll address that more in an animation in a minute, before I need to talk a little bit more about potential energy. We record the binding potential energy between particles as negative, because we need to add energy to the particles to remove their bonds and get the binding energy to zero. For example, if these particles existed in a liquid, and it required a total of 10 joules to heat that liquid to a solid, we would say that the bonds between the particles contain negative 10 joules of energy because it would require an additional 10 joules of energy being added to it to remove those bonds, turn it into a gas, and get the total energy in the bonds to zero because there are no more bonds between the atoms at all. So one more time, this is basically just a notation trick where we can say, oh, because we need to add some energy to this material just to get those bonds to zero, we can record it as containing this negative energy that we can cancel out and remove the bonds that way. 
So potential energy is recorded as negative when there are bonds between the particles. Going back to solid and liquid and gas, solids have very strong bonds, so that means that the particles in solids have very negative potential energy. Liquids still have bonds holding their particles together, the particles just don't float off into random directions, but the bonds are less strong than solids, and so they contain less negative potential energy. And in a gas, there are no bonds between the particles at all, so that means there's no potential energy between the particles. So even though there's no potential energy in a gas, gas actually has the most potential of any of the phases because the other two phases have negative potential energy and zero is a higher number than negative numbers. So there's more and more potential energy as we go from solid to gas, even though gas has no potential energy. That can be a little counterintuitive and take a little getting used to. So fusion adds potential energy and vaporization also adds potential energy because it's adding in energy to remove those bonds. And condensation subtracts potential energy and freezing also subtracts potential energy because that's taking energy out and making the bonds between the particles stronger. And sublimation also adds potential energy and deposition subtracts potential energy. The phase of a material only changes at very specific temperatures. The melting point of a material is the temperature at which the phase changes from solid to liquid. The melting point is also the temperature where liquids change back into solids. And the boiling point of a material is the temperature at which the phase changes from liquid to gas or vice versa. The boiling point can also be where gas condenses back into a liquid. As an example, the melting point of water is zero degrees Celsius and the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. When a material is not at its melting or boiling point, energy added to it changes its temperature, the kinetic energy of the particles. When a material is at its melting or boiling point, energy added to it changes its phase, the potential energy in the bonds of the particles. This can be a little complicated, so I'm going to give you an animation of the total energy contained in ice as we continuously add heat to it over time. And I'm going to pretend that the ice is starting at absolute zero, so it starts off with no kinetic energy at all. And because ice is a solid, that means that there is a lot of negative potential energies. So you'll notice that on the graph, the purple line representing potential energy is very negative. It's very below the zero point, and it's at the point where the material is a solid. You'll also notice that I have a picture representing the bonds between the particles. They're very strong right now because it's a solid, and I have a thermometer showing how the temperature increases as the kinetic energy increases. So I'm going to start to add energy at a constant rate to this material. Because the material is not at its melting point, all the energy that's added to it goes into changing the kinetic energy and the temperature, not the phase. The phase only changes at the melting and boiling point, and if it's not at that point, all the energy goes into changing the temperature instead. So it continues to add and change the temperature until the exact moment when the material reaches its melting point and it has some kinetic energy. As soon as it reaches its melting point, the energy that I'm adding to this continuously stops going into changing the kinetic energy and starts going into changing the potential energy instead. The energy that I'm continuously adding to it now goes into adding potential instead of kinetic and changing its phase. And you'll notice that the bonds between the particles become weaker until the material is a liquid. And at the exact moment when the material has become a liquid, it stops melting. And all the energy that I'm adding goes back into changing the temperature instead because it's done changing its phase. So once it's finished changing its phase and it's completely in its new phase, it's no longer melting. So all the energy adds kinetic energy and continues to add kinetic energy, which increases the temperature until the temperature reaches the boiling point of the material. And the boiling point is the other place where the material changes phase instead of temperature. So now all the energy is gonna go into changing phase instead of temperature. This time the material is evaporating or vaporizing or going through vaporization if we wanna use the technical term. So the energy that I'm adding now is being used to cancel out that negative potential energy and remove the last of the bonds between the particles until there are no bonds left. And when that happens, the material has been completely changed into a gas, and now any additional energy I'd add to it will add into its kinetic energy and continuously increase its temperature instead of changing its phase, because there's no other phase for it to change into now. So any additional energy I add will just add more kinetic energy and cause the temperature to increase. That was a lot. We're going to be circling back to this concept in the next few videos as we get a better and better idea of how to describe this process. But it's really important that you have that overview of what's happening where a material only changes its phase at the melting or boiling point and all the energy added goes into changing its phase. And anywhere outside of those two very specific temperatures, all the energy goes into changing the temperature rather than the phase. So again, we'll keep circling back to this in the next few videos. Just one last thing to note, the specific heat of a material changes based on the phase it's in. This means that different phases of matter require different amounts of energy to change their temperatures. 
So we know that water can exist as ice, liquid, and steam, and these are the specific heats of each. So you can see that ice has a specific heat of 2,100 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, water has a specific heat of 4,200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, and steam has a specific heat of 2,000 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And you'll see I've also written out those physical meanings in words. So that's the basics of what you need to know about phase changes. In the next lecture, we'll learn a new equation to understand exactly how much energy is required for a material to undergo each specific phase change.